So, well, welcome everyone to the first uh, public talk um, of the IAU Symposium 367. Uh, the first speaker in uh, this um, communication with the public uh, activity is Jay Pasakov. And Nestor Camino is the chair of the session. So welcome, Jay. Welcome, Nestor. Please, you. your, your space, the stage is yours. Thank you, Beatriz. Well, I want to introduce to you Dr. Jay Pasakov. He is from Williams College, Hopkins University of USA. But he doesn't need any presentation. He is a famous astronomer. But I want to remark a, a data that uh, Jay is uh, one of the persons who have witnessed more solar eclipse. Uh, the count is 35, Jay is, I hope I'm not wrong, 35 total eclipses and 18 annular eclipses. So it's uh, amazing how much uh, time has he passed under the the shadow of the moon in the whole planet. So we are pleased to to listen to your presentation with this uh, history of your life uh, with our eclipse. It's yours. Thank you very much, Nestor. I was glad to be at a meeting with you a couple of years ago. And I had hoped to be in a meeting with all of the people listening in Baraloche today. I'm still holding plane tickets, in fact, uh, as, as a round trip from Buenos Aires to, uh, to Baraloche. Uh, but uh, as you'll see later on, we have uh, other arrangements uh, for, uh, for the eclipse. And I do have some people going, uh, going to observe the eclipse leaving the United States today and tomorrow. I'm going to talk about eclipses that I have seen uh, very recently, and I'm very glad that my uh, National Science Foundation of the United States has been supporting my solar eclipse recently, and over time, the National Geographic Society has also, and we have some smaller amounts from uh, the NASA Massachusetts Space Grant and now the Sigma Xi Honorary Society uh, and others. Here is a composite image of uh, the eclipse uh, from dozens of individual frames in, uh, in 2017 when we had an eclipse in the United States. The solar corona is a thousand times as bright here than here, so no single piece of film or CCD or, M, uh, or CMOS will cover that whole dynamic range. So we take the best part of each of dozens of images and put them together to show you here the solar corona with these streamers going way out into space. Uh, and then at the poles, there are plumes that come out just as though there was a bar magnet through the middle of the moon. And this big black thing in the middle is the side of the moon that is uh, facing us. So we'll say more of that as I proceed. We are now at a minimum of the sunspot cycle. So here's the sunspot cycle from 2008 to 2020. And you can see that there was a peak in 2012 and 2014. In fact, there were uh, peaks at different times in the northern and southern hemispheres. And then most of the days in the last couple of years, there have been no sunspots on the sun at all. And now we're starting to get some sunspots uh, again. And I'll show you some pictures in, uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, the sunspot cycle is on the average about 11 years, but it does go from a couple of years shorter to a couple of years longer than that. And you can see the most recent cycle here. You can see it was a lower cycle than the one before and the lower than the one before that. Maybe there's some longer periods involved also, and we'll just have to keep watching for another few hundred years to see about the, uh, the long uh, periods. The uh, European Space Agency uh, just last week put together this series of observations from their solar and heliospheric observatory. The extreme uh, ultraviolet imaging uh, uh, 
camera. Uh, and you can see in 1996, there was a minimum. So this is in the extreme ultraviolet. This is hot gas, million degree gas uh, in the solar corona. And there was a peak around 2001, 2002 or so. You can see that, that there are bands in the northern and the southern uh, hemisphere that then go closer and closer to the equator. Uh, and then we had another minimum around 2008, 2009, and then a maximum uh, that I, of which I showed you the graph around 2014. Uh, we see a lot of uh, activity of hot gas there. Uh, and sometimes we see a coronal hole, which is a region of relatively low uh, density and, and temperature on, uh, on the sun. And then we've, we've had this extreme minimum uh, that is just starting up again now. If you plot not only the number of sunspots, but also the, long the latitudes that they're on, you can see that early in the cycle, the sunspots appear at high latitudes, about halfway up on the sun. And then, uh, and then as we proceed to, to maximum, they come in lower and lower. They don't go to the equator, but they disperse. Um, and, a, and, a new, well, and a new cycle is, uh, is formed. Uh, you can graph here the sunspot area, not just the sunspot number, which weights the uh, number of groupings of the spots in addition to the number of spots. But the area you actually have to measure is uh, harder uh, to measure. But here's a, uh, they agree, of course, and overall, but here's the correlation of the so-called butterfly diagram with the, uh, uh, with the sunspot area covered. And we're just starting to get some spots at high latitude in the, new, in the new cycle. When we are at maximum, we get streamers all over the sun. So here's an old image uh, taken at, uh, at uh, solar maximum from uh, 40 years ago. Uh, and you can see a few streamers peering out, but there are streamers even at high latitude. So the sun looks very round and we can measure the flattening coefficient over time. And here's an image, one of my favorite eclipse images of me with two of my students from, uh, from Williams College observing the eclipse in the sky, the corona around the silhouette of the moon and the umbra, the dark shadow of the moon uh, enveloping us. And then if you look low on the horizon, and this is true 365 degrees around, 360 degrees around, uh, we are seeing out of the zone of totality uh, and some light outside the umbra is scattering in towards us. But recently we've had this quiet sun that there's some magnetic field here in this, uh, in this image that was posted by Brian Goff. We can see the magnetic field has held up prominences on the edge of the sun. So a picture like this is in cooler gas, more like 10 or 20,000 degree uh, gas, which we see with a hydrogen alpha filter, but you see no activity on the surface of the sun. This is from last July. But starting this month uh, here, uh, we had a big sunspot that came across, uh, across the sun, which is very visible. And if you measure the magnetic field, you can see that the, as George Ellery Hale discovered in 1908 at Mount Wilson Observatory, the uh, sunspots are regions of very high magnetic field. There were around 3000 uh, uh, Gauss in the magnetic field. That's been declining a bit. It's uh, the average is down below 2000 Gauss. At some point, even when there's a magnetic field, it may not form a sunspot, but we're still seeing these sunspots. Here are some images taken from spaceweather.com uh, that come of the last week's uh, sunspots. So you see, we had a couple of uh, biggish uh, sunspots uh, here and another one uh, coming around, uh, around the edge on December 2nd. And on the third, everything's moved a little bit around as the sun rotates. The sun rotates differentially, faster at the equator than the poles. Notice there are no sunspots in the other hemisphere. And then uh, yesterday we had, uh, we had this sunspot uh, just past the center of the disk. We had these two sunspot groups. And, uh, and today they, that sunspot has moved over a little bit. The other one has disappeared. So we'll be watching the sunspots and see what happens as the solar cycle increases uh, over the next few years. I want to talk about solar eclipses in particular. 
and the first uh, map of the, the shadow of the moon falling on the earth and showing the path as it moved was across England in the eclipse of 1715 made by Edmund Halley, who wrote in this printed material at the bottom, the curious had desired to observe it and he wanted the people to watch and time it and see if they were in totality or not and send the information, which in fact he used then to put out a successor map for the eclipse of 1724 that went the other way and proceeded from England over the continent after making some corrections of a few kilometers in the, uh, in the position of that eclipse. So let me dwell on the most recent uh, eclipses. And in 2017, we in the United States to have a major eclipse come across our whole uh, continental United States from uh, west to east, upper left to lower right. It was the first time that there was a path like that in 99 years. Uh, and I've been working with a lot of my students at, at Williams College to study the sun and to study uh, eclipses and also working with uh, Wojtow Rusin from Slovakia and our computer guy, uh, Roman Benur and a number of our Williams College people. Uh, and this eclipse had totality restricted to the United States uh, for the first time, because the 1918 one went across some other islands that weren't American territory. You can see the partial phases uh, went down 90%, uh, 80%, 70%, et cetera down to the limit in northern uh, South, uh, South America. Um, and we wanted to get the eclipse on dry land so we could mount our telescopes with sturdy bases. So we went to intercept it at the first possible place in Oregon here. And so we were right here in Salem, Oregon. And then the eclipse proceeded across uh, the uh, whole continental United States uh, and went very near some of the uh, some of the major cities. And here in southern Illinois, it will be where an eclipse in 2024 intercepts going uh, going the other uh, direction. In 2017, the eclipse went out to sea uh, in South in South Carolina. Rooney Wright of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center does wonderful animations showing the circumstance of the eclipse. So we're seeing the side of the Earth in front of us that isn't the eclipse. The eclipse is falling on the other side and you can see the shadow of the moon going across the Earth. You can see there's an inner shadow and an outer shadow. So the inner shadow is the umbra uh, where uh, we will get a total eclipse and the outer shadow is the penumbra from which we will get only a partial uh, eclipse. So originally on the 14th of this month, uh, the whole group from uh, Barilos from the meeting were going to get in buses and going down to see the total eclipse, which is where the dramatic effects uh, are, are visible. In 2017, we were on the campus of Willamette University and I had a number of scientific colleagues with, uh, with me and, and uh, eight of our undergraduates and then some alumni who are now graduate uh, students. So we had a big group of people uh, observing uh, the eclipse uh, with me and we're very pleased to in involve our students and our alumni in, these, in this eclipse work. To see the partial phases as uh, uh, almost all the auditors of this talk of mine know, uh, the sun is about a million times brighter than the corona so it, you cannot safely look at the everyday sun without looking through a special filter that lets pass only one part in a hundred thousand or a million uh, of the sun. So here's the filter. This one has a little, on purpose, a little oranges cast. Uh, uh, but when the uh, sun is entirely covered after an hour or so, then we see the photosphere, the bright ordinary solar surface shining through some valleys on the edge of the moon. And, uh, and then when that's covered, uh, we can see the corona and depending on how long an exposure you make, the further out you actually see the corona. So these pictures are without any, um, any uh, filters at all. 
at, uh, as we get those mountains on the edge of the moon, uh, we see what are called Bailey's beads because they were found by Francis Bailey in an annular eclipse of a couple of hundred years ago. And then the last Bailey's bead is, is, is so bright that it looks like the diamond on a ring. It is known as a diamond ring effect. And we can now compare these Bailey's beads with the predictions uh, because the um, uh, Xavier Jubier, especially from France, uh, has taken the, uh, the calculations of NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance uh, Orbiter and before that, the Kogoya spacecraft from the last decade to make a 3D map of the surface of the moon. So now uh, the moon's libration, the slight angular changes it has facing us, we know exactly where the mountains are on the edge and we can actually map the, uh, where the Bailey's bees are going to be. And then by comparing them with the uh, observations, we can tell whether the size of the sun is a little bigger or a little smaller than the actual uh, agreed normal value that the IAU puts in its bulletins. And uh, Xavier Jubier and Ernie Wright and I uh, did give a paper about a correction that is needed to the IAU standard value for uh, eclipses. And again, this is based on the 3D mapping of the, uh, of the moon. At the edge of the sun, we also have the magnetic field uh, sticking up a little bit and a little more strongly. Uh, and we get what are called solar prominences that are visible in, uh, in hydrogen light, uh, even without an eclipse. Uh, but to see the corona and to see the polar plumes, uh, then, we need, uh, then we need an eclipse when the moon, we see here in the middle, blocks out the photosphere, the sphere from which the light comes, the everyday surface of the sun, and uh, turns the, the blue sky, otherwise blue sky dark in the middle of the day, uh, and, uh, and enables us to see the, uh, the corona, which as you see is not uniform and there are these big, big streamers that go out into space. In my Scientific American article from a couple of years ago, uh, we have this diagram of the center of the sun at 15 million kelvins uh, and then radiation transports energy out to about the outer third of the sun when we get a a boiling convection here that brings granules to the surface. Uh, and then above that is the photosphere with some sunspots on it most of the time. Uh, and then some magnetic field makes loops in the corona that we've been studying and these coronal streamers. Uh, and when there aren't streamers at high latitudes, we can see the polar plumes. Here again is a composite showing two hours with a, with a filter, and then finally the central uh, part of the eclipse when it really gets dramatically dark. The last minute it gets a thousand times darker, so it, there's an effect not only of the science but also of the spectacle uh, where it is very moving to be outside in totality as, as, as totality comes, and that cannot be duplicated uh, anywhere in the partial phases. So uh, I know we are all around the world listening to my talk today, instead of getting in buses on Monday to go to uh, totality, but I wish us all many total eclipses in the future. The European Space Agency's Solar and Heliospheric Observatory has on it not only the uh, imaging instrument that you saw uh, for the disk of the sun uh, earlier, uh, and, uh, and that, uh, but also what's called a coronagraph, where it blocks out the sun and the region around the sun going out a couple of almost radii of the, uh, of the sun. Uh, and then it can see on a daily or an hourly basis the streamers as they go out into space. And in 2017, you can see there are some that went way out and nothing near the, uh, nothing near the poles. And we can extend those into our eclipse uh, composite, uh, which fills in the gap. So only on the days of eclipses can we get a complete view of the sun from the surface to uh, through that inner corona that we study best at eclipses. 
and then the outer corona that can be observed from space on a daily basis. Here, instead of the imaging and the disk from uh, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, now NASA has a spacecraft called Solar Dynamics Observatory and our weather people in the United States, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration have what are called the GOES spacecraft series that can also have solar telescopes on them uh, that use filters to observe uh, what's in the center of the disk in the extreme ultraviolet and we've made a composite uh, like that. One of those weather satellites uh, took this image of the umbra going across the United States here. So here's obviously the United States and South America here. Um, and this is a real uh, that the shadow of the moon is really going across uh, the earth and it takes a couple of hours to go that distance. So we may get two minutes um, of totality here and two minutes here and two minutes here. But if you put it together, as we did in what we call the mega movie, uh, we could have a, a, a movie of the corona and changes in the corona a couple of hours long. So here at a distance of an hour and a little bit, 65 minutes, you can uh, see some features here that are changing here just in the space of an hour and at that great distance. And, and these big things are moving really very fast. Uh, to uh, to make those changes in that period of time. And if you look carefully, you see a number of things that are changing. Last year, on July 2nd, so um, just a year and a half ago, there was an eclipse that was largely over the Pacific, but it did reach uh, Chile and then right for sunset, Argent uh, Argentina. And you can see the shadow here Approaching, uh, approaching South America uh, on July 2nd, uh, 2019. And, uh, and meeting up with the, uh, the sunset. So where we intercepted it uh, with our ground-based telescopes in, in Chile, uh, it was low in the sky, only 13 degrees above the, uh, above the horizon. But here in Ernie Wright's animation from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, we can see the partial regions of the partial phases uh, and then the, uh, the small umbra only a couple of hundred kilometers across, elongated and then looking straight down at the slowest uh, speed of near the equator, the Earth's rotation can help keep up with it. So a plane flew for eight and a half minutes to keep up with the, uh, with the eclipse there. Uh, and then, uh, the uh, shape of the shadow elongated as it went around the curvature uh, of the Earth until it hit us in, uh, in Chile and then met nightfall in Argentina. My colleague Aras Volgaris was on the Saratololo, Saratololo Inter-American Observatory. I was able to have four people there uh, for the event. And here uh, are uh, images that we got with the, the Bailey's beads uh, making a double diamond ring effect uh, at the second contact when, when the moon went inside the uh, solar uh, radius and then a single diamond ring that uh, broadened into Bailey's beads uh, at the exit. And of course, the solar corona uh, inside in mid totality. We were uh, uh, trying to, ma uh, to match a lot of science goals uh, at that time, not just the imaging, but we've been looking over time to see how the magnetic field changes over the 11 year sunspot cycle. Sometimes we get coronal mass ejections. We didn't have any on that eclipse, but they, they uh, were studying the interaction of the sun with the earth, the so-called space weather. We had a couple of spectrographs uh, measuring a highly ionized line such as iron 14, which is iron that has lost 13 of its normal 26 electrons. And that's how it was discovered that the corona is millions of degrees hot, that it takes uh, over a million Kelvins to, uh, to ionize iron that much. Here's iron 10, so iron one is neutral. So iron 
2 is once ionized iron 10 is nine times ionized. And we also had argon 10 that we were, uh, that we were studying. And uh, in those coronal loops that I showed you a drawing of, we were taking measurements at greater than one Hertz uh, to look to see if they are vibrating in a way that could be the source of heating the corona to millions of degrees. There are many different models of how the corona is heated to that high temperature. Of course, it's a low density gas. So, so the high temperature means that the few particles there are are moving around very fast. Um, and we were testing uh, uh, one, of, one of the methods which is called surface alphane waves, which, uh, which have periods of uh, sub-second uh, duration. And then we were measuring the velocities uh, by comparing things and working with uh, Venezuelan atmospheric uh, scientist, atmospheric physicist, Marcos Peñalosa Murillo uh, to measure uh, the effect on the terrestrial temperature and pressure and wind, and sometimes put out gravity waves to the sides of, uh, of the uh, pan of, of totality. So we're studying again the interaction of what the sun is doing with us on here on Earth. Here again, we are at the sunspot diagram that you've seen before, just to remind you that we're just coming out of this uh, uh, sunspot um, minimum here uh, to the point where the sunspot number was close to 100. Uh, and uh, that means we had several groups and each of the groups had several different sunspots in them. At this eclipse, uh, I did have my team at the Saratololo Inter-American Observatory. They had two minutes and six seconds of totality at a height of 2,207 meters. And I was on the center line with another uh, set of uh, students and colleagues. Uh, and we got a little more totality, an extra half a minute there. And, but then even though we had worried for months or years about marine layers and weather, uh, even La Serena, uh, the, the city where the airplanes landed, um, where two minutes and 15 seconds of totality uh, had clear weather. Uh, and I mentioned the chartered big airplane that uh, Glenn Schneider uh, arranged at an eight and a half minutes of totality. And I am grateful for my team's support, especially from the US National Science Foundation. Here's the elongated Umbra uh, at uh, at my site at La Higuera, uh, right on the uh, center line. And, uh, and here is a, a GIF uh, in which you will see the, the umbra gradually move across and look at the diamond ring and all of a sudden the uh, totality is, uh, uh, is over as even the small bit of the sun uh, that becomes visible uh, overwhelms the, uh, the sky. And we're looking down over the town of La Higuera where there were many eclipse tourists for the event. Here is a series uh, from Dr. Dan Schechter. Uh, you can see uh, over the couple of hours, the partial phases and then uh, those are taken through a filter that don't pass anything else. And then the totality view shows the uh, duration of the umbra and the solar corona. On Saratololo with my colleagues, uh, Kevin Reardon and David Slisky and Alan Slisky here at David's uh, telescopes here, and we'll have something like this uh, with us uh, next week uh, in, uh, in Southern Chile. Um, and uh, so here, uh, David has his telescopes ready for the event and was set up uh, right in front of the dome of the four meter telescope at the Saratololo Inter-American Observatory. From that high altitude, it, the sky was very uh, clean and pure and it was a beautiful uh, event. And here we see the moon in the middle surrounded by the solar corona and then surrounded by the umbra um, as, uh, as we had mid eclipse in the two minutes and five seconds of eclipse at the Saratololo Inter-American Observatory. 
I mentioned the simulations that Xavier Jubier has been making, and he's now en route to join my team in, in Chile. And here are the diamond rings and Bailey's beads that, that you saw earlier. And he can now simulate that with his uh, program, Solar Eclipse Maestro, which we can also use for, uh, for uh, running the cameras and the exposures on the cameras. And, and we can match up the uh, durations and the locations of the Bailey's beads and the, diamond, and the diamond rings. And the free parameter then is the size of the sun. So that's what we're measuring with these. From La Serena, you see it was a little bit off the center line and the sky doesn't get quite as dark, but it still was very clear. And there was a beautiful view of the uh, eclipse uh, from, uh, from there. Uh, and uh, my son-in-law, my grandson took uh, this picture of the diamond ring on the balcony of our hotel in La Serena. We've already published some preliminary articles uh, on, uh, on it, and we have uh, also been uh, working with a group from a company called Predictive Science Inc. In, uh, in California, San Diego, California, that uses the magnetic field from the preceding um, month of, um, of measurements on the sun to predict what the corona will be like, and then we match that with our corona uh, and NASA, in fact, that, uh, that uh, next day uh, put out um, a press release comparing our, our observations with uh, their predictions, which I'll show you in a minute. And we've presented a meeting, the results at a meeting of Honolulu and a, and a meeting of the uh, IAU Symposium 354 that was going on at the time of that eclipse, just as the current symposium is overlapping with this year's uh, eclipse. Here is the fading from the, in bluish the predictions to in, in grayish our early uh, composites uh, and the overall agreement is, uh, is good and any uh, details in that don't quite agree can be used to predict the, uh, the model. So here are the uh, side by side, instead of uh, uh, morphing from one into the other, we see the predictions on the left, including that East Limb streamer and the, the measurements on the right, uh, rotated to match of the East, room, East uh, Limb streamer. We also had uh, spectra. And so Aris, Volgaris in particular, had the spectrograph that showed not only the sodium D lines, but also this yellow line near it that was first seen by Jules Janssen at the eclipse in India in 1868. And that actually led to study of the spectral line outside of eclipse uh, by uh, not only Janssen, but also Norman Lockyer, and uh, who concluded that this uh, element didn't exist anywhere uh, on Earth and existed only on the Sun, so they called it helium. So that was the discovery of helium. It took a few decades before it was isolated by chemists on Earth. And there also is a faint red line here from iron 10 and a green line from iron 13. And at solar minimum, the cooler line is a little stronger than the, than the higher temperature line. And as we go to solar maximum, then the iron 14 line will become uh, brighter. Here's the uh, sunspot diagram again, but now we've put on it the spacecraft to study the sun. Uh, you can't obviously point the Hubble Space Telescope, say, at the sun. The sun's just too bright. It would blow out the instruments. Uh, so there are special solar spacecraft, and the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory has been around for a long time. Um, Yoko has been has had its x-rays measurements superseded by the Japanese Hinode spacecraft. The Europeans had Praba 2 that's still going on. Then uh, the United States put up the Solar Dynamics Observatory, and more recently the GOES-16 and 17 spacecraft with solar uh, telescopes on them. 
and NASA's Stereo spacecraft uh, has a, a pair of spacecraft, one slightly inside the Earth's orbit, one slightly outside. So they drift around to the other side of the sun to give a 3D view of the sun. Only one of them is operative uh, still. Here is uh, our image here with the solar plumes here uh, and some coronal streamers at the equator. Um, and superimposed on it uh, is one of the images from that uh, weather satellite whose solar panels are always pointing at the sun. So now his solar panels uh, listed in it, run by our alumnus Dan Seaton from about 20 years ago for his undergraduate degree. You see a coronal hall, a little cooler here, uh, and but we can trace the features back to uh, some places on the disk. And, uh, and Dan has uh, six different uh, temperature uh, filters here. And so this is a color that overlaps some uh, cooler gas here and then some, some 800,000 uh, Kelvin gas and some million and a half Kelvin uh, Kelvin gas. Uh, and and uh, so we can study the whole sun on, uh, on those days. And here is just the highest temperature gas here. Um, polar plumes coming down to the coronal hole here and some of these streamers going back to just general areas at uh, more equatorially. So that's what we've been doing in the past, but what next? As you all know, uh, next week on the 14th of December, we have an eclipse, a total eclipse that comes across um, with a peak this time in Argentina. So we were hoping my group to go to Las Grutas on the coast uh, to make the observations there, but with various travel restrictions, my group has wound up going to, uh, to Chile, where we had special passes from the uh, government to get in and, and where there's actually an airport in the center line to which one can fly from the capital. So people are flying to uh, uh, Santiago and then to Temuco and, and we're driving uh, near there, but already Temuco is near the edge of totality and we're going to observe from the center line. So this is 2020. Then a year after that, in 2021, the eclipse goes over Antarctica. The weather statistics of cloudiness are not great there. So I'm intending to be in an airplane with Glenn Schneider and others to catch the eclipse at the center line, at the sunrise point where we can look at more or less zero degrees and see the sun not far above the horizon will leave from Punta Arenas to do that next December 4th. Then in 2022, there is no total solar eclipse. In 2023, the, uh, the total eclipse is on the other side of the, uh, uh, of the Earth, and I'll come back to that. So we've just now, from, from predictive science, gotten their predictions for what the corona will look like next week. And here's brightness, and then the log brightness just spreads this out a little more and matches what we do with our processing. So we see we expect some coronal streamers separated more on one side than the other and polar and polar plumes to be uh, to be visible. And uh, so they had a preliminary prediction a couple of weeks ago, but the magnetic field keeps changing. And of course, the magnetic field on the backside, we can't see directly. Uh, and some of it rotates around and, and eventually the front side rotates onto the back and gets out of date. But anyway, here are their final uh, predictions of the uh, brightness uh, that, uh, that they expect uh, to see. So this was the preliminary and this is the final. So it's not that different, but, it, it, but you can see some difference in these plumes, uh, for example. And then, um, uh, and then if they filter it to, to, to magnify the contrast, this is their prediction there, and you can uh, see their predictions of the magnetic field. Again, the preliminary and the final and the final predictions of the magnetic field based on uh, a couple of extra weeks of magnetic field observations on the surface of the sun. So that's what we expect okay. uh, next week. Then uh, in June, uh, there's an annular eclipse that goes up from uh, the Canadian border just over the, uh, the border from the United States and goes up over uh, Greenland and the North Pole. Uh, 
it's even partial in New York and where, where I live and work in Williamstown, uh, Massachusetts, and just where we'll go for that. I don't know yet. We'll see what the COVID situation is and, and how we can travel. Sorry, Shay. Yes. Five minutes left. Excuse me? Five minutes left. Yes. Yes. Just finishing up. Thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, fly from Punta Arenas to the Sunrise Point here. There'll be a number of ships uh, here uh, and some people landing on the Union Glacier for those observations uh, next, uh, next uh, December 4th. And then in 2023, uh, the eclipse, you don't always see it listed as total because it's annular at its end, uh, but the bulk of it is actually total and the weather statistics with blue is good uh, are uh, just clips this upper left hand corner of Australia. It goes over East Timor, uh, not quite as good uh, weather statistics and then bad weather statistics in the uh, New Guinea part. Uh, but, uh, so I hope to be totality here on April 20th, 2023 from Australia. And then we have a big eclipse uh, uh, well, then an annular eclipse over the United States and South America uh, here uh, in October 2023. We'll have partial phases through the United States. This won't be visible in Europe at, uh, at all, uh, but we'll go up to Washington, to uh, well, Oregon, where we saw that total eclipse in 2017, um, over, uh, but uh, then go over Central America too uh, here. And then in 2024, we have a major total eclipse going from Mexico, where the weather statistics are very good, through Texas, uh, and then over the uh, Midwest and Northern New England, where the cloudiness statistics are not great at that uh, springtime temperature as you see in the color coding. So I'm anticipating I'll go in the best statistics here in the Mexican coast. Texas is not bad, and we can't count on what we'll see there. And then, on October 2nd, 2024, we can go back to Patagonia, uh, where most of us are not getting this time and seeing an annular eclipse that, uh, that goes across. So here's a video from our site in 2017, about 15 seconds before totality. So these are spectacular events uh, to enjoy and hear the cheering, uh, and I wish you all good eclipses. We will be uh, seeing a lot of solar results in the next few years because of the new solar telescope in Hawaii, but I won't go on with that, with that now. Um, I think I've used up my time, and I would be glad to take questions and comments. So Nestor, will you read some uh, comments from chat or otherwise? There's some question or comments from the public. Not for a moment, I think. Jay, do you want to say something more? Well, I do have some information about this new dramatic solar telescope. So let me, so let me go back to that. In YouTube, you have a uh, one question. Okay. Well, let's let's have the one question. Yes, it's uh, Mariana Orellana. She is asking about uh, the weather prediction uh, because uh, 
the year the weather seems kind of different from the trend of the past of uh, of the past if you have any particular prediction about the weather uh, no i don't on the whole the statistics were better in argentina than in chile a uh, week before last there were a few days of clouds at the at the site in chile but then it, uh, but then it cleared up and uh, and and we will see it's not guaranteed it's never guaranteed and also the cooling of the atmosphere by the uh, eclipse itself can change the clouds they can make clouds form if there were clouds and they could make clouds disperse if there are clouds so one can never count on the eclipse weather because uh, unless it's really a storm uh, then uh, and you know you won't see it that there's a, a lot of a lot of variability so i wish everybody luck who, who tries to see this uh, this eclipse i heard today from sebastian gurovich from the cordoba observatory who's going to las grutas so i'm glad we'll have somebody on the uh, east coast of south america and then uh uh patricio rojo from the university of chile is going to be on the west coast of uh, Chile or slightly inland and my my group will be at the Villa Rica volcano near Pucon in uh, uh, in uh, in Chile and uh, let's hope for a clear day all across so let me say something about the big new solar telescope uh, it, it used to be called the a new technology uh, solar telescope uh, and then was named after the longtime senator from Hawaii where it is located, Daniel K. Inui Solar Telescope. And on the sun, uh, we see this boiling uh, phenomenon, the convection that I mentioned earlier on, and just a little bit of it uh, shows, shows these, uh, these features here that are uh, maybe a thousand kilometers across telescope itself is uh, quite substantial and uh, and it may even be able to view the corona in the infrared uh, without a, a coronagraph. Uh, it is rare to have astronomy on the front page of major newspapers, but last January 30th on the front page of the New York Times, on the, above the fold even, uh, there was this big picture of the solar granulation. And here we see a video of how these granules uh, form and, uh, uh, and merge. And in a close up here, uh, the bright is upwelling gas and then it moves uh, within a granule to the edges and then pools and goes back down and we see some, some little bits of magnetic field brightness between, uh, between some of those granules. It isn't often that there is a, a sun picture, a solar picture on the front page of the New York Times, but then I discovered one from a hundred years ago. Uh, this was from December 14th, which is the eclipse anniversary, uh, interestingly, 1918. So this will be 102 years before the eclipse. And the whole front page of the New York Times was taken up with an, a hydrogen alpha, H alpha image of the sun uh, the Earth size was put on for scale, and uh, George Ellery Hale had gone to Mount Wilson and built a solar tower telescope, and he had a method uh, of which we call a spectroheliograph, uh, an idea he got apparently when going by uh, somebody's picket fence and realizing that you've got different views through the picket fence, and in the spectroheliograph he worked out uh, you could have a slit that moved across and uh, and move the the photographic plate at the same rate, and you built up a, an image at any wavelength you chose. And here uh, was H alpha. Now we have some filters that aren't as pure as the spectroheliograph images, uh, but the spectroheliograph was the big invention in 1908, and led. Uh, I guess uh, uh, here it says 1919 here, but I may have misread it. That looks like 1918. I'll have to I'll have to check that. Um, in any case, uh, here are some pictures that Rob Rutkowski took on, uh, on Mauna Kea of the, uh, of the Milky Way in the sky, and at the edge of the frame, here is the top of, uh, of Dekist. 
And then uh, since I have a minute, uh, let me say something about another big event that's coming uh, this month uh, in, in Henry IV, part two by, by Shakespeare. They were talking about a conjunction and even something called the fiery trigon, which had to do with, with these uh, uh, triplets of, uh, of conjunctions. And this particular uh, conjunction is moving into constellations that the astrologers call fiery. Uh, and, but now it's a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. And Johannes Kepler wrote about it in his almanac from 1603. And he claimed an 800 year cycle. This is of course ridiculous, but, uh, but now he said in 1600, we had Rudolf II and 800 years earlier, we had Charlemagne and 800 years before that, we had Jesus and the star of Bethlehem and 800 years before that for Messiah, 800 years before that Moses, for that, the flood and Enoch and Adam and the, and the creation. So it was a big thing in 1600 uh, then, but now we have this conjunction, which is the closest that Jupiter and Saturn are coming uh, since, uh, since the year 1623. And Jupiter, of course, is in an inner orbit compared to Saturn, so it moves faster in the sky. But uh, between the 20th and 21st, Jupiter overtakes Saturn. So when I saw them, um, when it was clear in, in Williamstown, Massachusetts, a couple of nights ago, uh, they were a thumbs uh, width away from each other, which of course is about two degrees, and they're going to be a tenth of a degree, very, very close together, um, the closest in hundreds of years uh, on the 20th and 21st. So they're fun to see in the sky. Now uh, Jupiter is, is about 10 times brighter than Saturn, but they were quite noticeable. Uh, all of uh, Kepler's works have been published except for that, uh, that uh, one almanac from 1603, which is a unique copy that I worked with Harvard's Houghton Library to get uh, uh, some, some years ago. Uh, and, uh, but they really did talk about this list of every 400 and uh, 800 years. Uh, now it's only 400. So now we have this fiery trigon, the closest is 1623, uh, when Jupiter will be only a tenth of a degree south of, of uh, Saturn, and they're uh, just low in the southwestern sky. So they set uh, within a couple of hours after sunset. So as soon as it gets dark, uh, maybe an, an hour uh, after sunset, I recommend you go out and, uh, and look in these great conjunctions have been uh, followed for, uh, for a long time, and many people have, have written about them. And these great conjunctions are 120 degrees apart, so uh, which is why they are, uh, why that makes a trigon. So we have uh, an interesting astronomical month. Uh, the Geminids are coming uh, to peak on the night before uh, the eclipse. So some people have even said, are we gonna see a Geminid meteor? during the darkness of the eclipse. I think that would be uh, too much to, to ask for. But of course, people looking up can catch meteors out of the corners of their eyes and there'll be a lot of wide field photography. Beatrice, thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry, I can't be with you all in, uh, in uh, well, Buenos Aires or Bariloche or wherever. And I hope we'll all be together again soon. No, thank you to be here today. Is uh, it was a wonderful uh, uh, presentation. The chair is Nestor. I think Nestor has uh, some questions to you. Just one more question. Uh, somebody asked if you can explain which is the difference between inner and outer corona of the sun. Which? What about the difference? of the inner and outer corona. Between. I hear, I see my friend Margarita Metaxa is sending a note, thank you. So thank you, Margarita. I wish we could see you in person. Um, the, uh, the streamers are based in loops of magnetic field that are uh, relatively low uh, in, in the corona. So we have uh, different kinds of streamers. One of the kinds is helmet streamers. Uh, which are broader at the base and then come more at the points uh, going up. 
And so that would be a difference between the inner and outer corona. Uh, but basically, the brightness goes down very sharply. The magnetic field goes down. There are closed magnetic fields, and uh, charged particles tend to go along rather than across uh, magnetic fields. So we do get this, uh, this helmet uh, streamer uh, type that, that we see at eclipses, where the helmet part is only in the, uh, in the inner corona. And they resemble helmets that you see in 19th century European policemen, for, uh, uh, for example, which is why they're called helmet streamers. And, and then the outer corona, there'd just be some, some um, electrons that are going in, in straight lines or in the, in the, in the uh, fields, in, in the polar plumes. If you're just looking at the corona, then instead of measuring what's actually corona, uh, as we go further from the sun, two or three solar radii from the sun, we see a lot of light scattered into our point of view from dust particles in the solar system, uh, but we more or less at the orbit of Mercury. So we have two kinds of corona that we talk about, the so-called F corona from Fraunhofer, uh, which includes the absorption lines of the solar Fraunhofer absorption spectrum, uh, and uh, that does not polarize the light when it scatters to us, uh, but the real corona is the so-called K corona from the German word continuous, or the German equivalent of the word uh, continuous, and that is highly polarized. So in fact, to actually study the electrons and measure the electron density in the corona, uh, you, uh, you do want to make those polarization measurements or the absorption line uh, measurements and now both the Americans and the Europeans have spacecraft going uh, in close to the sun. So we hope in future eclipses to measure the electron density and the views in the past where these uh, solar orbiter and solar probe, uh, Parker solar probe are, are measuring parameters such as electron density directly. Okay. Uh, thank you. Oh, one more question. If you know if in this uh, eclipse some research group will uh, perform the Ed Eddington experience? Um, I don't think the Eddington experiment, which of course is so important in testing relativity, I don't know of anybody doing it at this, at this eclipse, but I do know of people who are already organizing to do it in Mexico in 20. Uh, in 2024, and it was done several times in, uh, in uh, 2017. So it's interesting that was the major research for Eddington, uh, important in 1919, which we've had the 100th anniversary, now becomes uh, an experiment for amateurs, for qualified amateurs and careful amateur astronomers, but nonetheless, uh, something for amateur astronomers. Relativity has been verified in so many other and better ways since then. Okay, well, there's no more questions. Okay. We, we thank you very much. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Sorry, not uh, you, you couldn't come to Argentina to, to see the eclipse. But uh, it will okay. be. Okay. That, that is life, also, it's the nature. And we'll, <laughs> and we'll talk. You are mute, uh, Jay. We'll try to. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Uh, bye bye. Everyone, this is the last uh, the last activity today. Thank you very much to be there in uh, at Zoom and uh, at the YouTube channel. If, if there uh, were many people also so thank you very much and see you tomorrow uh, tomorrow is the the whole day is the symposium and the public talk tomorrow for those who are interested in that is a, a public talk in spanish uh, performed by juan belmonte from spain and the topic is uh, astronomy Sorry, it's in Spanish. Astronomía, Paisaje y Patrimonio Mundial de Gran Canaria a Chanquillo, pasando por Menorca. Well, you are invited.
uh, a different topic, a topic uh, on uh, heritage, in fact. Jay, thank you very much to be here. We feel you very, very near, even in the distance. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Oh, bye, bye, good bye. room. See you tomorrow, good room. <laughs> bye, bye. Bye, Mary Kay. Bye, bye. bye Rosa, Margarita, George. Uh, well, anyone. Anyway. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>